Well, you probably heard that there was a big to-do. I believe this happened all happened yesterday, the shooting in Atlanta at the courthouse. In case you didn't, I will tell you what I know, and what I know is not too detailed. I have not followed this, but I did uh, download an article from CNN just a little while ago. A, uh, an individual was on trial. He was uh, in custody, and he was brought into the courthouse. And this was in Atlanta, attended by a woman deputy who was about half the size of the suspect, the defendant. And he overpowered her, took her gun, shot the judge, shot somebody else, got away, pistol whipped a man, shot another uh, individual, um, mugged a couple of people, and then uh, took prisoner, in effect, a woman, and then finally surrendered. But in the process, he had killed, uh, let's see, four people altogether and um, uh, caused a lot of havoc. Now, this happened in a courthouse where you would expect there to be a lot of security already. But I'm sure that they will beef up the security now in the Atlanta courthouse. They will have uh, stronger metal detectors. They will have more deputies. They will have more searches and pat-downs and the whole works. And it all brings to mind the question about government itself. The federal budget that George Bush has submitted is almost $2.6 billion and will probably be well more than that by the time fiscal year 2006 is over. That's the fiscal year that runs from October 1st of this year through September 30th of next year and is voted on during this spring and summer and supposedly voted on by September 30th. Sometimes they don't make the deadline. But that's $2.6 billion, which alone is about 25% of the national income. It means one out of every four dollars that we earn goes to the federal government, and it doesn't include state and local taxes. And the U.S. Census Bureau used to compile every year a report whereby they consolidated all three levels of government, federal, state, and local, weeded out all the double spending, that is, where the federal government spends money giving it to the states, and then the states spend some of that money on something else, and rather than have it show up twice in the accounting uh, as federal spending, state spending, and then maybe local spending, they weed all that out and they got it all figured out exactly how much money was being spent by government as a whole. And that figure regularly came to around 47 or 48 percent until they stopped compiling it in the mid-90s. And I don't know anybody else who compiles it now. If anybody listening to this show knows of some agency, some private agency, whatever, that compiles this information on the total spending of government in the United States, I'd certainly like to have it because I have been for years creating graphs and so on. I've had them in my books about the total spending of government. But what we had was in the mid-90s when they quit doing this, almost half of the national income was being spent by federal, state, or local governments. Now, the question is, why do people put up with this? Why is it that people are not outraged? Why is it that people do not get on their high horse and say, we want to get rid of all of this? Well, I think the answer, really, if you have to boil it down to a single answer, I believe that answer is that people put up with government, with the red tape, with the false arrests, with the tremendous security procedures at airports and other places like that, with all of the things that we regularly comment on, not just we libertarians, but we the people of the United States, the fun that is made of politicians, the jokes about politicians, lying, all of these things, all of these negative things about government, they are all tolerated. They are recognized but tolerated. Why? Because people feel that without government, they would not be protected that they have to have this government as imperfect as it is in order to protect them locally from criminals and nationally from foreign powers that might try to invade and occupy and take over the United States of America. Well, the interesting thing is that even though we tolerate government for this purpose, we don't get it. We don't get protection on the streets. Would you walk through the downtown area of the city in which you live, or the, if you don't live in a city, the nearest city to you, would you? Would you take a chance on doing that? I don't believe you would. If you would, you would be one in a hundred. People walk down those streets only when they have to. And as far as the national protection is concerned, we saw in 9-11 that the government doesn't protect us from foreign attackers at all. The government is very good at going over and smashing up a country like Iraq and creating mass devastation there so that they can take more money from us to rebuild Iraq. It's very, very good at turning Afghanistan upside down and leaving it run by warlords and with the largest opium production in the world coming out of Afghanistan now. It's very good at overthrowing foreign governments like they did in Iran in 53 and in Guatemala and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Indonesia and a whole lot of other places. But it doesn't protect us. It can't protect us. 
and it provides more and more and more and more police state security procedures, but we still know that we are vulnerable and can't be protected. Well, is it just simply impossible for us to be protected? Is the climate of the culture so different now from what it was 50 years ago that morality has sunk to a new low and that's why crime is such a terrible problem in America today and these kinds of shootings that happened yesterday in Atlanta? Uh, is that what's wrong? What is it, that we don't have enough police, that we don't have enough prisoners, or that it, or enough prisons, or that it just isn't possible to protect us from crime because we can't have policemen with us all the time? Do we have to tolerate this much crime? Is this just the natural order of things? Has society's morals deteriorated so much that there are so many more criminals today than there were 50 years ago per capita? Or is it that we're not spending enough on prisons or policemen or parole officers or uh, psychologists. What is it? Well, I can tell you what it is, and this is my opinion, but by God, I can't see it any other possible way. I think that there are four main reasons that crime is so much greater today than it was 50 years ago. And in fact, before I give you those four reasons, let me repeat a story that I think I've told on this show before, but not recently. When I was a boy, when I was a lad, a 10, 12 years old, I used to go to the movies by myself in the evening. Uh, sometimes I, I would go with my parents, but my parents had no objection to my going alone, provided everything else was all right, like my homework was done or whatever. But they were not afraid of me going to the movies by myself, even though I was just a little kid. The theater, it's hard for me to estimate, but the theater was, my guess, about a mile from our home. I went through to walk to the theater. I walked through a residential district, which was close to half as much. And I'd say it's now that I think about it, it's more like a mile and a half or so. And through a residential area for maybe 40% of the way, and then down the main street of Sherman Oaks, California, where we lived, the main boulevard, Ventura Boulevard. And I walked along there uh, for quite a distance to the theater, which was on Ventura Boulevard. I was like any other little kid. I was afraid of the boogeyman, but I was had no reason to fear any particular thing, specific thing like gangs or something of that sort. There just simply was no such thing as gangs there. Yes, there were packs of kids that hung out together in school, and some of them were toughies, but there were no bloods, no crips, no uh, brotherhood, no anything like that roaming around Sherman Oaks causing havoc for little kids like me. And I would walk home from the theater after the movie was over at maybe 10 o'clock at night. Now, can you imagine if you had children and today you would let your 10- or 12-year-old child walk a mile and a half to a theater at night like that and come home at 10 or 11 o'clock at night by himself? Of course not. You'd have to be crazy as a parent to allow that unless you live in some very, very small, low-crime town way away from the big cities. All right. Why the difference between when I was a kid and today? Well, as I said, I think there are four main reasons. Reason number one, gun control. Gun control has made this country so much less safe. And I'm not talking about this particular gun control act or that gun control act. It is the whole body of gun control. The whole concept of gun control is at fault. I don't care whether you have a machine gun in your backyard just so long as you never use it. Just so long as you never use it to threaten me or to do anything to cause violence or the threat of violence to any other human being. Maybe you're a collector. Uh, maybe you like to fiddle with things. Who knows? But there is no reason in the world to have a single gun control law. Can you imagine if there were no gun control laws and no metal detectors and none of these things, and that fellow, name of Nichols, at the Atlanta courthouse, when he went into that courtroom, do you think that he would have gotten out of there alive if he pulled a gun and shot the judge? Of course not. There probably would have been 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 people in that courtroom, depending on the level of crime in the community, I guess, but a number of people in that courtroom with concealed guns who would have whipped them out and fired them at Nichols, and he would have never gotten out of that courtroom alive. More than likely, he never would have bothered pulling the gun, uh, overpowering the, the young woman and taking her gun from her because he knew what would happen when he got in that courtroom brandishing a gun around. Somebody would have pulled out a gun and shot him before he would have had any chance to return fire. Do you think that those hijackers on 9-11 would have ever made it to New York to run that plane into the World Trade Center if people on that plane had had the opportunity to carry guns on if they wanted to? It was a jumbo uh, jet probably carrying about 200 or 250 people. 
If there were no gun control laws, you can be pretty darn sure that out of those 200 or 250 people, there would have been at least two or three people carrying guns. And those guys, of course, they had box cutters, and if there were no gun control laws, maybe they would have had guns too. But two or three people with guns would have caused havoc there and probably prevented the airliner from ever making it to New York City. 3,000 people might be alive today if it weren't for the gun control laws. Uh, I could go on with example after example. Uh, there are thousands and thousands, if not in the millions of crimes, that are prevented almost every year by people just simply brandishing a gun at an intruder who busts into a house and then finds himself up against somebody with a gun. Uh, people are caught by civilians who have guns, but yet everything is directed at keeping those guns out of the hands of individuals, uh, out of people who are innocent citizens who want to protect themselves and their families. We need to get rid of all the gun control laws, and that's probably the most important thing that has to be done. But there's a lot more. We need to get rid of all federal laws having anything to do with law enforcement. That sounds like a drastic step, but it isn't a drastic step at all. It is, in fact, exactly what the founding fathers of this country had in mind, and they knew what they were doing when they set the country up so that the federal government would have no business in law enforcement whatsoever. I've uh, cited this statistic before, and I didn't think to get it out and get it right in front of me, but in 1941, there were 1,400 and some, uh, like 1,472 or something like that, homicides in the city of New York. 1,470 murders. And... The population of New York City today is the same as it was in 1941. While a lot of cities around the country have doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size, New York City hasn't. It's still around 6 million people, like it was in 1941, mainly because there's no place to build any more residences and so on there. So, in 1995, they um, had something like 4,500 uh, homicides, and this was celebrated as a great victory in the war on crime in New York City. In other words, they now had three times as many homicides, and they were celebrating it as a wonderful thing that Mayor Giuliani had done to reduce crime in New York City. So this gives you an idea of how much it's changed. But getting back now to, to the second problem, which is federal intervention in law enforcement. The Constitution of the United States does not mention any common crimes whatsoever, like murder, rape, robbery, extortion, fraud, Securities violations, none of these things are authorized in the Constitution as matters to be considered by the federal government. There, they are, there is no authorization in the Constitution for Congress to pass laws on any of these matters. The only three crimes mentioned in the Constitution are treason, piracy, and counterfeiting. And, of course, uh, those are crimes that don't really concern us. The Secret Service does take on the job of fighting counterfeiting. But even the counterfeiting was not meant to be the counterfeiting of currency because the federal government was not meant to issue any currency at all. It was the counterfeiting of treasury bonds that is mentioned specifically in the Constitution. But the point is that the federal government was never intended to have anything to do with law enforcement. That was to be handled by the states and the cities. And it was the right thing to do because each state and each city could figure out what to do for itself. And, of course, there were situations where state law enforcement or city law enforcement or small town law enforcement ran rampant and uh, may have uh, terrorized people in the town. But people could move out of a town to the next town over, or if at worst move out of the state, cross the state line to the next state, and be in a completely different atmosphere if there were problems in that state. But you can't escape the federal government without moving out of America itself. Now, what has the federal government done? Well, just to come back to the problem in Atlanta yesterday, one thing the federal government has done is to dole out money to the states for law enforcement. Every year, the president in the State of the Union message, uh, whether it is Bush, Clinton, or anybody else, says, I have a program to put more cops on the street, or I have a program to fight this kind of violent crime, or I have a program to do this. What he means is, in my budget, there will be $2 billion or some other figure that's going to be doled out to the states in order to do some particular thing. But once the states have gotten hooked on these uh, federal dollars, and every state is hooked on them now, in order to continue getting those federal dollars, they have to abide by all the strings that the federal government attaches. Is that a surprise to you? Of course not. Well, what are some of those strings? Well, some of them are that you can't discriminate in your police department against women. And so what happened in Atlanta? We had a woman that was maybe a foot smaller, and my guess is 125 pounds or so lighter than the prisoner she was supposed to get herded into the courtroom. Uh, 
And because this prisoner was on trial, he could not appear in the courtroom in shackles because that would prejudice the jury. And I understand that. But if that's the case, if you can't shackle the prisoner, then you better doggone be sure to have somebody guarding that prisoner, and maybe two or three people guarding that prisoner, who can handle him. Not a little five-foot woman who can be overpowered very easily. But the federal government says if you want to keep getting this money from us, then you've got to abide by these non-discrimination laws. And, of course, no discrimination against the handicapped. And on and on it goes. And you have to have sensitivity training of, about homosexuals. And, you, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And all of this interferes. What it does is it takes policemen away from the jobs they should be doing. In many cases, these extra cops on the street are not cops walking a beat, but maybe cops investigating victimless crimes. Who knows what goes on? But the point is that it isn't the federal government who should be making these decisions. And by doing so, they are diverting resources from law enforcement to all kinds of meaningless things. And when criminals see that law enforcement is weak and impotent, then they are emboldened. And people who are on the margin, people who are not quite sure whether they ought to go get a job or just hold up a 7-Eleven, see the situation and realize that it's a lot easier to hold up a 7-Eleven now than it was years ago, so maybe I can actually get away with it. Third, the third big thing is asset forfeiture. Asset forfeiture laws exist at the federal, state, and local level. They say that if it is suspected that a certain property was involved in a crime, the law enforcement agency can seize the property. And even if the people who own the property are never convicted of the crime, even if they're never indicted for the crime, even if they're never arrested for the crime, even if they're never suspected of the crime, the law enforcement agency can still keep the property. In other words, if your teenage son brings home a friend who lights up a marijuana cigarette in your house and the police have been trailing that son because they thought he was a lead to a, a drug gang or something and they bust into your home and arrest this guy, uh, this kid, they can seize your home as being involved in a drug offense. And you might never get it back, but if you do get it back, it will be because you had to hire a lawyer and sue the government to get it back at your own expense. Now, what happens to that property after it is seized by a law enforcement agency? It is then either sold at auction or the law enforcement agency keeps it. Uh, if it's a house, then there's no point in keeping it unless they want it as a safe house or something. Generally, they will just auction it off at some point. You've all heard about sheriff's auctions and so on uh, that occur from time to time. If it's a car, the law enforcement agency may keep it. Uh, they may have need for another civilian car or whatever. But you can imagine that when all this property that can be converted into money is available through the means of asset forfeiture, that asset forfeiture then becomes an important part of a sheriff's department or a police department or a state trooper's department, highway patrol department, because now it's a way to supplement the budget that it gets from the legislature with a whole lot more resources, mainly money. Uh, that's another thing, is that cash can be seized from people just on suspicion that a crime has been committed, and if it turns out that the crime wasn't committed, that still does not automatically return the money or other property to an individual from whom it was confiscated by the law enforcement officials. That individual still has to sue the state to get it back, and that might be a very expensive process. And if you've, they've seized the person's bank account, he doesn't have any money to hire a lawyer to sue the state. So many times... Many, many, many times the property is never returned. It is kept and turned into cash by, if it wasn't cash already, by the law enforcement agency. All right, you can see the end of this story. People in these law enforcement agencies then start targeting suspects or uh, potential crimes or whatever on the basis of the asset forfeiture possibilities. Instead of looking for the most guilty people, they look for the people who have the best property to be seized. And there is a long, long, long list of such seizures that have taken place in America where it became obvious afterward that no crime was involved and certainly not the person whose property was taken. Um, houses in, in places like Malibu, California, uh, houses that are worth a million dollars have been seized. Uh, and in many cases, uh, they, they have stakeouts to try to assess the value of property before raids are taking place, especially drug raids. So asset forfeiture is another way in which Law enforcement resources have been diverted away from protecting the population and toward enhancing the law enforcement agency's budget through asset forfeiture. All right, number four is the obvious one. Victimless crimes have become legal crimes. In other words, if you smoke marijuana where no one is a victim, no one is a victim. Uh, you only have a victim when one person uses violence upon another, when one person is a predator upon another, when one person threatens another, when one person 
in some way interferes with what we consider the rights of another person. Somebody smoking marijuana, somebody shooting himself up with heroin or snorting co cocaine is not a threat to the rest of society. If he commits a crime under, while under the influence of drugs, then he is guilty of the crime that he has committed, not for snorting cocaine, or shouldn't be. Any more than somebody commits a crime when he's drunk, he should not be convicted for being drunk, but convicted for committing the crime that he committed. But because all these victimless crimes are in the books, and the drugs are the most obvious, but there's also prostitution and gambling are the, are the next two big ones, because these are on the books, tremendous resources are diverted away from law enforcement, from protecting the population, uh, and instead are aimed at fighting drugs, prostitution, and gambling. Fifty years ago, there was a small vice squad as part of a big city police department, and that vice squad would spend some time hassling prostitutes, spend some time occasionally catching a drug dealer or whatever, but it was a tiny part of the police department. Today, it is a huge part of any police department, and policemen are taught to lie, to pose as drug dealers, to pose as drug buyers, to, in many, many ways, try to entrap people, and all of this takes away from the protection of the population, and it's no wonder that violent crime, true crime, is way on the upsurge when the police are so diverted. And let's wrap up this whole business about why crime is greater now than it was 50 years ago, and not just greater, but many times greater. In three ways, funds, resources uh, have been diverted away from the job of catching criminals and diverted into other things. Those three ways being federal intervention and crime control by handing out money and then putting strings on it to get the police to solve social problems instead of criminal problems. Number two to asset forfeiture, which is diverted uh, resources of the police and the other law enforcement agencies into trying to confiscate property that they can use to pad their budgets rather than going after criminals. And three, diverting resources towards the prosecution of drugs and prostitution and gambling rather than people who are violent and pose a real threat to us. Finally, we cannot expect the police to be everywhere. The only way we can really protect ourselves is by protecting ourselves, by having burglar alarm systems and, and things of this sort. But most important, that citizens be allowed to own and carry guns and do whatever is necessary uh, to protect themselves. And there is no fear that we're going to turn into a Wild West atmosphere. Even the Wild West was not like it's uh, pictured in the movies. But before we had any gun control laws in this country, we did not have people shooting each other on the streets. And we need to restore the ability of citizens to protect themselves. You don't even have to own a gun when there are no gun control laws. Just the knowledge of the criminal that somebody in your neighborhood probably owns guns, and you might be the one, is going to keep that criminal out of your home because he isn't going to take a chance in walking in, uh, through your front door and then finding that you own a gun and that you shoot first and ask questions afterward. So just the existence of guns in the community is enough to deter, deter criminals from your home, even if you don't own a gun. That's why even if you don't own a gun, you should be in favor of getting rid of all the gun control laws. I want a society similar to the one in which I grew up, in which even little children were safe on the streets, where little children could play in their front yards without any fear of being abducted, where it was quite all right for kids to go to their friend's house at night, walking the streets to get there, walk to the movies as I did. Um, gosh, when I was a kid, we used to ride our bicycles around the neighborhood or uh, various different places, and it didn't matter whether it was night or day. We were safe, and I want that kind of safety now. And, of course, on a national level, I want the kind of safety that can only come from our government keeping its nose out of other countries' business and spending maybe $50 billion or $100 billion on defense of this country rather than half a trillion dollars on offense, the ability to intimidate other countries. And let us begin with Mike in Ohio. Good evening, Mike. Hi, Harry. I just wanted to say I agreed with everything in your first hour that you said, and I don't participate in the voting process at the, uh, at the, at the ballot. But I do believe my vote as a juror does count. And I wanted to know what's your opinion of bringing in fully informed jury association material into the jury room, because just recently I've been called up for jury duty. Well, I think, I think it certainly is a good idea and that there is nothing really wrong with it except that they may throw you in jail for doing so because the judge will probably instruct the jury that its only purpose there is to evaluate the facts and not evaluate the law that uh, the defendant is being tried on. Uh, and for those who do not know what we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the concept of jury nullification, which is a time-honored practice in English common law, and, of course, uh, English common law was transferred to the colonies in the United States and became a part of the early United States history also, and that is that jurors who do not agree with the law 
that is at stake in the particular trial may vote to acquit simply because they think the law is wrong. And, of course, today where that is most important is in drug trials where people are being tried on nonviolent drug uh, 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 violations. And um, a juror... I, I would, go ahead. Harry, I would, say, I would say that it's in drug trials, in tax trials, and gun trials, uh, or any other crime where an individual is harmed, which is an increasing amount of laws are directed at uh, victimless crimes in this country. Sure. It's just, uh, but, it's what, just... what, what would you recommend about uh, persuading my other juror members, uh, because I do have some experience with this, and I wasn't, I wasn't very successful in persuading the, jury, the other jury members, but I did hang the jury, so it, it, uh, that day that, that person didn't, uh, did not uh, go to jail. Yeah. What was the trial about? Well, they were carrying concealed weapons without a license. Oh, and I see. I, yeah, so I it was ideal. I don't think that's crime. Right. You might get called up for jury duty, and the, the trial might be about somebody who held up a liquor store, in which case jury nullification wouldn't come into play at all. But I would not. I, I would suggest that you not take literature with you, but you're obviously well-versed on this subject, so I think it's just a case of in the jury room pointing out that this person has not committed any kind of violent crime against anyone else, there is no victim in the case, and that you couldn't possibly vote to convict when he hasn't done anything to hurt society or any individual in any way whatsoever, and uh, uh, see if you can make your case. And as you said with the other case that you were already on, uh, you're not likely to be able to persuade all 11 of your fellow jurors like in... 12 Angry Men, or some other great movie, but uh, you might hang a jury, and a prosecutor then might decide that it's not worth retrying the case. Well, yeah, I guess I guess that is the solution, is, is just do my best at persuasion, and uh, it, that is if it is one of these increasingly larger and larger, you know, percentage of our laws are directed at nonviolent... Uh, sure. Uh, and, and also, before you make your little pitch in the jury room, uh, think about it. You'll have, of course, a couple of days to, you know, involved in the trial and so forth. So give some thought to exactly what you're going to say. Go over it in your mind when you're taking a, a shower. And, uh, I mean, this is what I do frequently, which leads to the speeches that I give in places and sometimes what I say here on the radio show or in a, in a television monologue uh, for Free Market News Network. And, uh, uh, it, it helps greatly to go over this in your mind. Now, when you get in there in the jury room, you will find that you will forget something that you were going to say. And when you walk out of the jury room, you say, oh, darn, I forgot point number six or whatever. But so what? You spoke from the heart without notes and without any text and without any literature, which is much more convincing than when you are reading from something or just checking your notes or whatever. And to me, it's always worth it to forget some part of what I was going to say uh, as a, a small price to pay for being able to speak in a much more spontaneous and emotional way from the heart. And so uh, I, I really do suggest that you spend a lot of time thinking in your mind, not just about the concepts, but the examples you're going to give, the, the, the very words that you're going to use. And you won't remember all that, again, when you go into the jury room, but you'll remember a lot of it. Well, thanks a lot, Harry. That sounds like some really good advice. Well, I'm giving it to you and to anybody else listening to this broadcast who finds themselves in any of these kinds of situations where you may have a chance to speak to several people. Because remember, it isn't just hanging up this jury that's uh, trying a case that should never have come to court in the first place, but you're also talking to 11 fellow citizens, and two or three of them may be impressed enough that they go out and do something about this that maybe you were not able to do, but these people have been convinced by you, and maybe they can, as I say, do some things that you can't do. And that's what we're doing any time go out and speak. Anytime we talk at the office, anytime the opportunity presents itself without making a pest or a bore of yourself, but the opportunity presents itself to talk to your fellow citizens. You never know who's listening, who has the influence, the wealth, uh, the opportunity, the connections to be able to do things that you can't do, and maybe you're going to be the one that pushes him over the line to take advantage of those resources he has and do something that wasn't possible before. Mike, so, I'm so glad you called because you raised a very, very important issue, and I'm really glad that you're trying to do what you are uh, trying to do. I think it's very, very valuable. So thank you so much, Mike. All right. Um, we uh, have uh, some lines open right now. If you'd like to call 1-800-259-9231, that's 1-800-259-9231, or send me an email to question at harrybrown.org. Some questions that have come in. Uh, James out in cyberspace um, says, Come 2010 or thereabouts, thanks to George Bush, you will get to choose how to invest your mandatory 33% of gross income towards your Social Security. And the choices that will be available to you under the Bush plan will probably be uh, you can invest in the Halliburton Investment Group or you can invest in the Carlyle Investment Group or the Bechtel Investment Group or the Clear Channel Investment Group or Wonkel's Arctic Area Refrigeration Services. <laughs> These are the choices that will be available to you under Bush's Social Security plan. Very well put, James in cyberspace. And let's go now to New Mexico and talk with Al. Good evening, Al. Hi, Harry. Um, I uh, just heard about uh, your example about sensitivity training and all that stuff, and I had an example I wanted to share with you. Sure. Um, 
I uh, used to work in a government lab, and I uh, remember that Simpo Lee case when that came along. It's um, it was a big political hot potato. What was the case again? What was the name of it? Win Ho Lee. Oh, oh, yeah, uh, a spying case. Right. Well, they reeked of racial profiling, and the government didn't have really much on them, but they kept them in solitary confinement for about nine months. And it's, um, But the upshot of it, which no one found out about, um, was that every government lab worker had to go to sensitivity training except Bill Richardson and Bill Clinton. Um, so it's just a politically correct answer. Okay, we were wrong. Um, we, we racially proved this guy with no evidence. And, <laughs> So and you're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> right, right. So every employee had to undergo three full days at government expense of sensitivity training. Oh, wow. So that's, uh, that's our government work. Um, and another yeah, that, that's, that's one and a half percent of your yearly uh, work time was put, right. in, put into that, just that one thing alone. Right, it was just a political hot potato, and they needed to look like they were doing something. So uh, the workers, or, and then you have, you have to hire outside contractors uh, to uh, you know, teach the seminars and all this other Stuff, which um, I'm sure John Cree taxpayer would be pleased with a bunch of to know his taxpayer dollars went to that. Yeah. Um, and another unrelated note um, about environmental um, aspects, um, I work with microelectronics, and uh, when I worked at the government lab, none of the materials that were used were ever recycled. And I just interviewed with a company, a private company um, involved in this, um, uh, Intel, and they recycle 70% of their waste. Um, so just for people who think that we need to have stiffer governmental standards, uh, Government's the biggest polluter of all. Oh, and, definitely. And uh, the private corporations have a vested interest in looking good to the community. So for the environmentalists out there, um, you know, they should know that the government's the big polluter out there. Out there. This is probably much more than the corporations are. Uh, there's no question about that. About six years ago, the Boston Globe uh, published a five-part series on uh, pollution in America, and they said that the government was by far the biggest polluter and that the uh, – the biggest polluter within the government was the Department of Defense, but number two was the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. That at, wow. at, at their testing facilities, uh, they would just dump the waste that comes from all this testing that they do. They would dump it in nearby streams and so forth. And uh, I'm going to check and see if that's still on the Internet, because that's where I got it to begin with. And if it is, I'll put a link to it on my radio links page, because it's quite a story that was told there by the uh, Boston Globe. And understand that the Boston Globe is one of the most liberal newspapers in America, so it's not as though... Uh, they are a uh, hate EPA uh, <laughs> source of this. Uh, it took a lot of courage for them to publish it. Right. Okay. Well, uh, hey, Harry, I really appreciate your show and your column. Beating me in arguments probably a hundred times without even knowing it. <laughs> it's, got, it's got to the point where every time I read one of your articles and I disagree with something you say, I no longer say, God, Harry's wrong. I say, God, where did I go wrong? <laughs> so uh, right. you're a great voice for liberty out there. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say that. And thanks for calling. Glad to hear from you. All right. Thanks, Harry. You bet. All right, let's go to San Diego now and talk with Dan. Good evening, Dan. Good evening, Harry. Good to hear from you. Uh, uh, for those who don't know Dan, he's been around libertarian circles for a long time in San Diego as an activist, and uh, I had the pleasure of seeing him just a month or so ago at the San Diego Libertarian Party Convention. And Dan is a rock musician who, in addition to being an eloquent speaker for liberty, is also an eloquent uh, musician for liberty. And uh, what, what is that uh, called? Uh, Peace Rocks, right? Uh, the, the website is actually peacemakersrock.com. Because real peacemakers don't rule. Peacemakersrock.com. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and you did an album recently. Uh, was, did that include any propaganda? <laughs> oh, well, actually, if you buy my CD and you open up the brochure and to read my lyrics and credits and things, I have a, a little uh, endorsement of the Libertarian Party in there. I see. Well, I don't think uh, I said Dan. I don't think you'll object to my saying uh, we're talking with Dan Litwin, will you? No, not at all. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, Dan, Dan Litwin, yeah. Uh, so what's on your mind tonight? Well, uh, I was listening to your uh, monologue about the the reason that crime is more prevalent now. And a couple of your points uh, dealt with things that have diverted law enforcement resources uh, away from fighting real crime and into uh, pointless or destructive uh, areas. Right. And your, your area on the, the victimless crime, it, it wasn't where I thought you were going to go. It was, it was true what you said, that, that it uh, diverts law enforcement. But the very act of outlawing drugs, let's just stick with drugs, for instance, has created these huge black markets. And not only are we diverting law enforcement into chasing these these so-called criminals, but we're, we're creating a situation where actual violence pays uh, because, of course, and as you know, uh, I just want to remind the audience that it's a double-edged sword. Not only is the, the, are the police running around chasing people they shouldn't be chasing, but because of that, the profits in selling these drugs are great, and it creates this violent black market where gangs profit uh, from shooting it out with other gangs, where um, drug cartels profit by being murderous thugs, and where terrorists even make money off of it. And so it actually builds up the actual crime itself. Um, 
And I, I even had a letter to the editor published in the USA Today where I was talking about, imagine being born in the middle of one of these gang zones in a major city, seeing the killer be killed reality around you. And yeah, you might as well have been born in the Soviet Union for all the freedom you have under those circumstances. Right, but, but of course you become, you have a killer mentality born into you. You, know, kill, you wonder why someone would kill someone for their tennis shoes. Well, when you're born in the middle of an inner city gang zone and you see that life is cheap and that you kill or be killed, this is a kind of, it's not just that police resources are diverted to following uh, people who are using cocaine and marijuana, it's that there's an entire breeding of, of the criminal mentality. Yes, the hunt for victimless crimes not only diverts resources away from fighting real crime, but it creates more crime because it creates a black market in drugs, and that black market will, of course, be operated by the worst elements of society who then engage in uh, gang warfare, who kill children in drive-by shootings, and all of these other things that uh, go on that uh, add so much to the crime of the city. And then, of course, that justifies bigger budgets for law enforcement. That justifies more controls over our lives, uh, the ability to get uh, warrantless searches and all all these other things that happen, and of course we have all heard about so many mistaken drug raids where a uh, house has been uh, attacked by a SWAT team, the door broken in, and very often somebody uh, in the house dies in the raid, and then it turns out that it was the wrong house or that these people had not really had anything to do with it after all. Somebody just snitched on them because he didn't like the people, uh, their dog was barking, or who knows what the problem was. But you're making a very good case, Dan, and I did not bring that up because, as it was, it took me an hour <laughs> to get through the whole subject, and I don't think we wanted to spend the second hour on it. But I'm glad you brought it up because it is a very, very important part of all of this. It's, it's how the whole concept of law has been perverted, as Richard Mayberry so eloquently put it in his book, Whatever Happened to Justice? The basis of common law was two principles. Do all you promise to do, meaning the, that you should uh, adhere and honor whatever contract you make, whatever promise you make, do it. Whether that's to pay somebody or whether it's to deliver a product or a service or time or whatever it is, do that. And secondly, never intrude upon anybody's person or property without his permission. And anything beyond that is not part of the common law, but once you stray from that, then you have opened the door to every conceivable kind of law that any legislator wants to pass. So, Dan, I'm glad you brought it up, and here I am making another speech. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to add to what I was saying. Yeah, you make another speech. Okay. Well, because of the gang violence that comes with uh, drugs being sold in the black market, what I was talking about was that there's a whole culture of violence being created and people being born in these gang-infested zones and seeing that that's the lifestyle. Uh, not much has been said about it, but there's been an entire music uh, culture called gangster rap, gangster rap, that has come about glorifying this violence. And it, it just stems out of the same thing that I was talking about before. People growing up, seeing violence all around them, they begin singing, rapping about it, and it becomes glorified and beautiful to them. And, and we shouldn't be surprised that making these things illegal results in a deterioration, actually, of, of the society. Yeah, uh, I think you're right, and, and it is this kind of stuff, the gangster rap and so on, that leads people to attribute greater crime to a decline in society's morals, to a more complex world. You know, they, they search all over to come up with these reasons, and uh, it is this kind of stuff, the gangster rap and the other things that, that go along with it that lead people to search for these answers. And, of course, it seems very remote to those people searching for answers to think that this might have something to do with too much government. Uh, um, before I go, I just wanted to point out, the reason I called my CD Peacemakers was because it was a, that was actually a tribute to libertarians. Uh, on the other side, we have the war makers, whether they have the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on terror, or the war on uh, whatever it is, the war on libertarians even sometimes. <laughs> uh, libertarian policies bring about peace, whether it's peace in your city, in your state, your world, because, uh, it, it, well, everybody just think about it, you know. We get rid of these kinds of laws, and, and as you pointed out, Harry, on your show many times, the free market re rewards virtue. But uh, the kind of examples we've been talking about tonight show how the opposite is rewarded in today's society because of these ridiculous laws. So libertarians are the peacemakers, and that's, that's why I dedicated my CD and called it Peacemakers and dedicated it to libertarians. Very good. And your site, again, is peacemakers.com, right? <laughs> peacemakersrock.com. Peacemakers Rock. And if you listen to the music on this show, it may make it hard for you to remember Peacemakers Rock. So write down peacemakersrock.com and take a look at the site. Thanks so much, Dan. I really appreciate hearing from you whenever. Nice talking to you. And now uh, let's check some more email here. Joy in cyberspace, in reference to my saying that prostitution is a victimless crime, along with gambling and drugs, says, what about young girls, often runaways, who are sucked into prostitution, who are threatened by their pimps and beaten if they try to escape? Prostitution in and of itself may be victimless, but the recruiting of prostitutes is a whole other story. Well, uh, it's a very good uh, question that you're raising. First of all, we need to separate the prostitution from the beating. The beating is a crime, obviously. And the threatening is a crime. And kidnapping is a crime. All of those things are a crime. And as you say, they tend, though, to happen more frequently with prostitutes than they happen with other people. Now, why is that? It is 
because prostitution is a crime. And that creates two problems. Number one, the prostitute cannot go to the police for help because she herself is considered a criminal by the police. Therefore, she can be beaten with impunity in many cases. Now, I'm not saying that no prostitute will ever complain to the police. Police, many prostitutes have working relationships with the police who turn another, uh, what's the expression, uh, turn a blind eye to the prostitute's activities. But in general, the prostitute does not have the protection of the police, and so the pimp knows I can do anything I want with this prostitute because I'll never be prosecuted for it. The second way that prostitution being a crime creates this is that instead of prostitution being run by businessmen, as it is in Nevada where it is legal, instead of it being run by people who are looking at profit and loss statements and, and all of these other things and advertising and doing all the things that a normal business does, in other places prostitution is run by who? Criminals, people who are willing to evade the law, people who are willing to commit violence, people who are not businessmen at all, but thugs. And those are the people that become these pimps. And so, naturally, there is a lot more beating, a lot more kidnapping than there would be if prostitution were legal. And, again, I have to say that all you have to do is look at Nevada, where prostitutes just don't live the same kind of life that they live in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or Kansas or any place else. It is the law itself that creates so many of the problems that we associate with lawlessness. But thanks for your uh, question, Joy. I'm glad you raised this. And I got another uh, email saying that it, uh, with regard to what I said before about the Boston Globe series, pointing out that government was the biggest polluter in the country. And, of course, we, don't need to, uh, we also need to recognize that private pollution exists almost entirely on government property. Not entirely, but almost. Maybe 85 or 90 percent, I would estimate, of the pollution that we think of, where people are dumping things in streams and lakes and so forth. I mean, they're dumping it on government property and the clear cutting and strip mining and all this takes place on government property that's leased to private uh, private uh, companies that have no stake in the future value of the property, so they just go ahead and ravage it to get the most short-term profit out of it that they can. And they would never treat their own property that way. Anyhow, unfortunately, that Boston Globe series is no longer on the Internet. And then Jan wrote and said, in addition to that he'd like to see the Love Canal article up there from Reason Magazine, and I'm not sure whether that's still available. I think it probably is, and if it is, I'll put it up there, but I've also decided that I will put up my own article, Saving the Environment from Political Destruction, which is actually a chapter from my book, The Great Libertarian Offer, and it does cover the Love Canal example, and it quotes from the Boston Globe article, so it's rather a complete uh, presentation of the environmental situation in America, and that'll be up there by uh, the end of the program or within five or ten minutes after the end of the program. And we have an email from Kelly in Oregon who says, the plethora of these victimless laws doesn't it cheapen real offenses like murder, rape, and robbery? How can citizens respect the law when we know that law enforcers lie and entrap? Well, it's a very good point. All of this stuff does diminish the respect for law. When they see that things like smoking a marijuana cigarette are illegal and can get you in prison, then, then you begin to think that the other things that you've been told are wrong, like lying or stealing, must not be as bad as I thought they were because they told me marijuana was a terrible thing and it was going to lead to heroin, it was going to be a gateway to all sorts of things, and none of that came true, so I don't know that I want to believe any of the other things. And, of course, no one in school is teaching where the line should be drawn between what should be legal and what is illegal and so on. So there is a very great mishy-mashy uh, sense that attaches to the law now, and there is no bright line that divides uh, what is good from what is bad and what is good from what is evil. Kayleen in Massachusetts writes to say, I know the answer. The only way we as individuals can protect ourselves is to resurrect the Second Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which is, of course, the right to keep and bear arms. And she says, as for the horrific incident in Atlanta, it was probably due to bad organization and bad choice of guards. I regret it happened, but as for individual protection, we must restore the Second Amendment. Uh, last week, I referred to the fact that I will be starting a television show with the Free Market News Network, in which will probably begin airing the end of this month. There I said that we would be trying to get congressmen and other people who are spouters of the prevailing wisdom on the show and ask the questions that never get asked in interviews that you see on television and never get raised in news articles and the Internet articles that come from the major news sources like CNN and ABC News and so forth. And Bill in Vancouver says you uh, are missing the point when you say you would like to ask the tough questions. I should interrupt there, Bill, and say that I don't believe I said I would ask tough questions. I just said I would ask the questions that we would want to ask these people but never get asked on television. But to go on, Bill says politicians in their life will never directly answer these types of questions. Their answers will either try to obfuscate the issue or be some hackneyed regurgitation of their philosophy, the bit latter bearing little or no relevance to the subject matter. To prove this, try asking these types of questions to a socialist. Furthermore, these interviews are generally very predictable and extremely boring. They do not make for entertaining radio show. Well, I have to disagree with you, Bill. First of all, if you ask the question and the politician evades the answer, it is the mere fact of raising the question that you have pointed out 
a perspective on the issue that isn't getting pointed out in any of the TV talk shows or the interview shows. And that's the first thing that's gained by it, is just the point is being made. Now, I could make that outside of an interview just by standing up and saying it to the camera. But it's better when I ask it as a question of somebody who's defending what's going on with the government or the foreign policy or whatever, because then his inability to answer it directly and to provide a reasonable support for this, his position further emphasizes the importance of the question that was asked and the point that is implied in the question. Uh, one last question we'll take uh, quickly. Uh, Jonathan read in my online journal, which I'll come back to in a second, that I'm having trouble finishing the War Racket book, because for, uh, which is a chronicle of all the lies and promises that have been told to lure Americans into war after war, uh, because there are so many of them, and there's so much involved here, that just writing about World War I filled about half of a normal book. And Jonathan says, instead of chronicling every government lie told in the last century to lead America to war, why not just a handful of the worst ones? I'm sure that would be enough material for an engaging book, and it would be easier for readers to digest as well. Of course, you could tell the reader in your introduction that it's not an exhaustive list of lies, just a fair sample. Tolstoy already wrote a war book that's 14,000 pages long. I wouldn't try to duplicate that. That's what Jonathan says. Is War and Peace 14,000 pages long? I've never read it. I, I, but you must be exaggerating. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I have thought of several different uh, ways of handling this. But I think that this material must be told. And what you said makes a lot of sense, Jonathan. Uh, I think the story of World War I that I wrote is very, very interesting, not because I wrote it, but because the material is so engaging and engrossing of how Wilson tricked America into the war and then how Wilson deliberately sabotaged all of the promises that he had made in getting America into war. Uh, all the things that he said that were going to come about by America getting into the war might have actually come about if he had just simply done what he said he was going to do, but he deliberately gave them up because he decided that something else was more important to him than fulfilling all those promises. And it's quite a story, and it's quite a story to read what a demented individual Wilson was and how America was putting its faith in a demented individual in the White House, just the same as it put its faith in World War II and Franklin Roosevelt, who nobody who knew Roosevelt thought would ever survive his last term because he was so sick, not just of body, but of mind. And then we have JFK, who was making important decisions for the country and was so hyped, uh, drugged up on uh, medication for his back that... Uh, he probably wasn't making intelligent decisions either. Well, that music means we've got to go, but thank you again for tuning in. Uh, do something. Do something good for your family and yourself this week, and don't forget to come back next week. Good night. <laughs>